Good evening and welcome, first of all, to our own society members. Thank you for supporting us uh, this evening. And for those people out there that have joined us via Eventbrite, thank you for also um, buying those tickets and joining us this evening. We've got a fantastic uh, talk tonight by Roy Berg. It's on the history of Chingford the District Model Engineering Club, but you probably know them more uh, by the name of um, Ridgeway Miniature Railway, which um, I'm sure that um, yourself and perhaps your children um, have been on um, many a times back in uh, back in the day, and in fact now as well. So that's it. It's now time to hand you over to Roy Berg. Now you're going to ask me where is Roy? Well, Roy is actually sitting right next to me. He's in the house, as they say. So I'm going to pass you over to Roy now, and he will introduce um, his slides. One moment, please. Can we see Roy? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much indeed for inviting me here this evening to uh, talk to you about the Miniature Railway. I'll apologise to start off with that I will be referring to some notes uh, because some of the uh, information I have gets rather complicated, but I'm sure uh, you will find that interesting. Uh, first of all, I'm going to let you know a little bit, a, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a Chingford boy. I was actually born in uh, a Forest View in a nursing home there overlooking the forest. And my early years of life, I lived with my parents over the shop in Station Road called Chingford Green Joinery. Um, we then moved to Endlebury Road and I went to school at uh, Chingford C of E and then went on to Wellington Avenue and did not do very well academically. I um, then took an apprenticeship with uh, London Transport and did two years of the apprenticeship and then I became uh, a driver on the underground and then after five years I decided it wasn't for me so I left and joined the Royal Air Force and I then served uh, Queen and Country for 34 years up to 2002. How did I get involved with the Chingford District Modern Engineering Club? Well basically it's a story that I was stationed at a place called RAF Holton in Buckinghamshire. And I came home one weekend after the station commander informed us that we were going to have an open day and all clubs and uh, associated with the station had to put a display on. Now, at that time, I was involved with the miniature railway there or the model railway there, or O gauge. And I was up at uh, Ridgeway Park looking at the railway there and there's this locomotive goes puffing past. Uh, it's a light blue and on the side of it, the locomotive was called REF Holton. Now I was absolutely amazed why this locomotive was called that. So I introduced myself to the driver, then spent the next hour and a half going round and round the track behind him, getting the history. Now what basically happened was um, the apprentice school at REF Holton, wanted some good engineering skills and it was decided that they would build locomotives and a, uh, a locomotive was designed for them and it was then built at the apprentices built it at RAF Holton. Uh, three of these locomotives were built there. Uh, with my time there I did some research and unfortunately cannot find out where any of those locomotives have gone but there's a few others been built around the country. Uh, the owner named Ron, um, I approached him and completely remembering that he had never met me before the half an hour before. And I said, can I borrow your steam locomotive, please, and take it to Holton for the open day? To my amazement, he said yes. And on the said day, he brought the locomotive over and we met him at the garden. I have found out since he was very concerned about the security of the locomotive because these things are not particularly cheap. And, but he was rest assured when he found out that I was the senior NCO in charge of police and security. And uh, when he got a couple of Burley policemen helping him move the locomotive, he became quite relaxed. He did ask me to join the club there and then. And unfortunately, I did point out that I only came home at weekends. And I don't think my boss would approve of me spending a Sunday afternoon when I'm only home, home a few days a month. So I did promise that the day I left the Air Force, 
I would uh, join the club and so did. And I joined the club in uh, 2002 in July. I became the safety officer in 2004. And then um, for some reason I got um, lumbered, chosen, coerced into being the chairman in 2006. And I've been the chairman since, ever since. Right, you've heard enough about me. Let's tell you a bit about the history of the club. A advert was placed in the model engineer in a department called the Smoke Rings uh, by Mr. Mills, who lived at Firelight Avenue in Chingford. And he wanted to uh, start a club up and asking for like-minded people to, to come in. From this advert, we received yes, some letters back. Um, requesting uh, to join the club. And if you notice the date, they are all the 30th of November, 1944. And we have one letter that actually states, uh, when this uh, inconvenience of a war is finished, I would like to come home and join the, the club. And they, it is weird to think that the war was still going on, but these people were looking ahead, okay? One of the things I like to highlight, and I have to thank this picture from the Chingford at War um, book, that the club started on the 12th of January, it was the first meeting, 1945, and the meeting was held at 2 Fairlight Avenue. And I believe 12 to so a number of people turned up for the meeting. I mean, the club was formally formed on that day. But I'd like to remind you that the Second World War was still uh, raging on. And during the period of September 44 and the 27th of March uh, 45, Chingford, like the rest of London, was subject to long range V2 bombers, uh, V2 rockets. On the worst of these attacks was on the 5th of February at 2 a.m., where a V2 rocket landed in the front garden of number 58 and to 62, uh, Engleberry Road which completely demolished uh, 54 to 64 and away, a total of seven houses. And if anyone is, uh, I understand the local area, Fairlight Close is not that far, it's just up the top of the road. Uh, one of the things I find very interesting in this picture, you've got the crane sitting on the left-hand side. That is actually the house I now live in. So I'm pleased to say it's not like that now, it has been rebuilt and it's a lot better than it looks there. Um, in the, being a, the generation that they were uh, or are, uh, the, they were going to go forward. They're not just going to form a club and sit back. So an application was made to the borough of Chingford to request consent to run a miniature railway in Ridgeway Park on August Bank Holiday 1945. Now, again, the war in the Far East was still going on at that time. Uh, but they also cheekily said to the council, uh, we'd like you to pay for the insurance uh, because um, the club had no money and it was requested to run a portable track, a portable track similar to the one here, but this is not the one. It's the only picture I've got of a portable track uh, in the park and it would be 100 foot long. And they wanted to run it on uh, Saturday, the 4th and 5th of August. On the 21st of June that year, the council's insurance company requested to inspect the locomotives that would be running in the park. And on the 27th of June, 1945, permission was granted on a number of conditions that any money that was raised from the use of the park for the purpose of the above mention will donate to the Borough of Chingford Welcome Home Fund. And the club was to remove the locomotive track from Ridgeway Park at the conclusion of the performance on the 5th of August. The first train actually ran in the park on the Saturday, the 4th of August, 1945, on a hundred foot of track for the, those next two days. The railway was actually positioned at, off the gardens of Goldsburg Crescent, running up and down there. And the locomotives were uh, slightly smaller than the scouts we use now. We, we call two and a half and three and a half inch, uh, like the ones in the next slide. 
Oh no, it's not. I've got it wrong. <laughs> so anyway, um, the club agreed to these um, members, uh, these, these these conditions, and uh, it was all agreed. These are a picture of some of the founder members. Please note they're all collar and tie, and uh, they are really uh, a smart bunch of gentlemen. As on the uh, the club then invited. Yes, please. The club then invited the mayor of London, uh, mayor of uh, Chingford. Uh, Councillor P. Powell to become the first president of the club, he, which he accepted in a letter dated the 30th of November 1945, but then opened the first exhibition that the club ever did in Walthamstow. Okay. On the 24th of May 1946, the Borough Council Parks and Open Spaces Committee held a meeting with the club committee members to discuss a general operation of a model railway, model railway and erecting a 500 foot of track within the park. The club stated that the club would be ready for September 1946, which was going to be Victory Day. On June the 46th, the council approved the operation of the railway in a letter dated the 7th of June with the following recommendations. The model railway is to operate a 500 foot uh, of track on Victory Day. The rides were restricted to children and that no charges will be made for the rides on that day. The model engineering club be requested to prepare and operate the model on Victory Day from 3 p.m. onwards and or at such times as notified by them by the vice chair, Councillor Hart. The offer of the club to operate the miniature railway on the club offered to run the miniature railway on Whit Sunday on the 10th of June 1946, and that was accepted. Until the addition of locomotives, because as you can see, they are very small. They were small locomotives, uh, two and a half inch, three and a half inch gauge locomotives. It was agreed that the railway would only operate uh, with children. Uh, um, I think this is a, a pu publicity stunt because I don't see any children. <laughs> but so uh, we go forward from there. And the one of the things that does make me laugh the, from the immediate, the 8th of June, 1946, the council set the charge for six pay, six D for adults and three D for children. But again, as I said, it was only limited to carry children at this time. Yeah, okay. Um, the model, the railway was allowed to, uh, any receipts that the railway operated uh, would be paid to the council in full, and a third of the gross receipts would be paid back to the club monthly to cover working expenses of the club. The, the model uh, railway stations would be named Ridgeway Park, and if we built a halt second station, uh, that would be called Wellington Avenue Halt. Wellington halt. Today they're called Ridgeway Station and the halt actually became known as uh, Willow Tree Halt because it's parked right underneath the big Willow Tree. Uh, the season would uh, start at Easter and we would run till September each year. And on the 12th of August 1946, it was agreed with the council that this would be agreeable. On the 18th of October, the borough, account, the borough treasurer informed the club the total receipt for the running season, which ended on the 30th of September 1946, was a total of 22 pounds, nine shillings and sixpence. And in accordance to the agreement, one third of the working expenses, which amounted to seven pounds, nine shillings and tenpence, was paid to the club in a check. The Railway then decided to build a continuous loop uh, with multi-gauge. So there was uh, going to be two and a half inch, three and a half inch, five inch track so that you could play with different locomotives and what have you. Uh, an, ever, an effort was normally made to get club members along. And as like most organizations, you get a lot of support in the bar or in the tea bar. Uh, but when it comes to going out and getting cold, it's, it doesn't quite uh, work out that way. Um, a lot of people, um, just hang on a second. Um, 
may remember that the winter of 46, 47 was absolutely apparently very bad. Um, and the falls of snow, and uh, it was very difficult to get the word done, work done. And a Mr. Presswell, Presswell uh, was praised highly uh, for carrying out the task, defi uh, define the awful climate. Uh, and um, the fuel cuts came along with rationing, and it put paid to the job for a little while. It, Easter arrived, and the track and what they had was quite badly damaged with, uh, with the winter, and uh, they had to go working and get it ready to run. It can now be said that the Boa Council was not very happy with the progress that the club was making, and it was rumoured at the time that they were in danger of losing the, what they had. A, fantastic, a, a frantic appeal was made to the members of the and to complete the job. They responded well, and on July the 5th, the last section of the circle track was bolted into position, and a locomotive called Highland Lord was in steam at the time, and amongst cheers and the mingling sighs of relief, she made the first trip all the way round the track. Please note on the, can we just go back one? Yeah. If you have a look at this picture, when they built the, uh, the track, they had no support between the pillars. And what then happened over the time is they sagged. So the train was going along and down, up and down dips and what have you. So it was then agreed that, so they would, uh, there we go next. Then we agreed that we would then go to concrete. And these are the uh, arches that they built. You have, we have to remember at uh, that time, um, getting items like wood, metal was very difficult. After the Second World War, the, no, not yet. You're too keen, he's keen. <laughs> After the Second World War, uh, when the fighting had finished, the spirit of the country to keep going between 39 and 45 was all but gone in two years, drained away by people with a lack of adequate housing, money and prospects. The only thing that was in abundance was Russian ration coupons uh, for meat, butter, lard, margarine, sugar, tea, and the list goes on endless. But what really brought the country to its knees was the end of the American support. It was not just Britain's fighting spirit that had been drained up, but certainly so had the flood of cash and community common items from across the Atlantic to fuel the war. The taps had been turned off. The clubs uh, agreed to build an experimental notice. I did Excuse me, we missed the tram. The blue box. Russian No, that's not. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. I'll go there. Yeah. Right, in September 1940, um, we, uh, a club magazine started called The Echo. And in front of you is actually the very first copy of a two sheet document that was uh, sold to the members for all of a penny and uh, telling them about the history okay next and the other pages with this about what was going on and what have you now we um then this went forward we were very lucky that uh, this ran until 1958 these magazines and from that um we've managed to find two complete copies of every magazine that was produced so it gives us a real insight on what the club was, what the people did, how they felt, um, how things, uh, instead of looking through rose glasses, every time we had a meeting, everyone turned up, it, then the, it shows the frustrations of the committees trying to get people to come in and do some work. But um, what then happened was uh, we, uh, the club decided to build a, an experimental petrol driven locomotive and to the reintroducing of petrol coupons, the club had to plea, apply for petrol coupons and uh, to be able to run the locomotives and also uh, to uh, let the members be able to bring their car, their, the locomotives to the railway or go to any other um, uh, place they needed to go because there was a great shortage of fuel. 
The application was also made to the fuel overseer uh, for the necessary supply of coal to operate the railway. Okay. The license to uh, run the railway uh, was issued by the Chinkard Borough Council on the 3rd of October 1949. And negotiations had been completed with the council whereby the CDMEC would take full control of the passenger carrying track in the Ridgeway Park. Uh, the running of the railway uh, is considered by the council one of their amenities uh, to educate, uh, educate, entertain the children uh, and local residents. Uh, the conditions of the agreed, uh, agreement was that the club would run at least once a week from Easter to September, preferably on the weekend, and we still run to that rules now. We open every Sunday as from uh, April the 1st, and we close normally uh, for passenger hauling at the end of September. And that's now been in agreement since 1949. By the locomotive you can see in front of you, and you'll see a number of pictures of her, is a, a locomotive called Firefly. Uh, it was purchased by the club on the 29th of August, 1949. Uh, when a uh, motion was put to the members uh, of the committee to empower them to purchase a locomotive from an RC painter from the uh, Bristol, uh, sorry, Bethnal Green Club. Uh, he, they were charged £80 for this locomotive and uh, the vote passed uh, 29 for and one against. The, it is a, a one inch to the foot scale 442 Atlantic. Uh, and it uh, was me uh, delivered immediately. One of the interesting factors, the day it arrived on the 4th of September, there was a, a club meeting from the uh, Kent Model Engineering Society, and there was another locomotive that was identical to her called Jacko. It then was realized, found out that Firefly and Jacko was actually built by the same person, uh, Mr. Waddington. We have done requests to try to find out where Jacko is, and unfortunately we cannot find it. The first day of service was on the 18th of September, 1945, and she did her job well. Okay. Now, probably what the railway is most famous for is uh, one day we had a visitor. Um, and the story of him arriving, if, you, if anyone doesn't recognize the picture, it's Walt Disney. And um, he, we have a friend called Mr. Pierce, who was the editor of the mechanics. Uh, he came along with none other than Walt Disney, um, the American creator of the well-known cow teams. Mr. Disney showed great interest in the track, a report which appeared in an American publication which he had read. There was no doubt that he was a real engineer and had reported that he had made his own locomotives and he had his own miniature railway. Uh, at home. And this picture is of, a of Walt Disney looking at a locomotive called Bambi. And um, an interesting fact was uh, I put a, a, a story into the Guardian uh, when it was going local, ask, uh, and about showing about Walt Disney trying to advertise us. And a lady came up to me and said, um, I've got Bambi, it's under my stairs. I kind of said, oh, yes. And I went round and saw it. And her grandfather and father made the locomotive. And it was in a box underneath the stairs. She was kind enough to lend me the locomotive. And we put it on display and took some pictures and what have you. When I asked her uh, if the club could have it, she said, no, it's the only thing I've got left of my grandfather's. And I want to keep it. About 18 months ago, she contacted me and was moving house and was unable to find anywhere to store it. And she's now given us the locomotive, which will go in pride of place uh, on display uh, as, uh, as part and parcel of the uh, Walt Disney heritage. Okay. Now, obviously, the newspapers covered it all. And this is a, an article from The, the Guardian uh, telling everybody about it. One of the stories that we were told, and I don't know how true it was, that the mayor was opening Chink for Day, and then the people found out that Walt Disney was there, and they all left with the mayor talking away and came to see uh, Mr. Disney. But I don't know how true that one is. He was then offered the, excuse me, 
He was then offered an honorary membership of the club, which he accepted <coughs> and, was, and was presented a badge at the club that had at the time. He kept in contact with the railway and he sent out magazines and railway uh, uh, magazines from America. And uh, on the Christmas of 1953, he sent us this card. Now, unfortunately, he didn't personally sign it, but it's still quite a unique uh, document that we have got. The next film I've got to show you is a, a little bit of a unique film, and I think I'll let you watch it, and then I'll give you some details because it gets quite complicated. So we go ahead with this one. Basically what this is, it's a film of um, an advert came in the press about a locomotive doing a 60 mile run non-stop, five inch motor uh, engine, and the members of the club decided they were going to try to break this record. Now, they then decided to make it more difficult, they were going to use a smaller engine and they're going to use a three and a half inch um, island last. Now, um, they did a, a practice run, or they, they, they tried to do it first of all, uh, but unfortunately, uh, she became derailed. So the in between the tender uh, and the locomotive broke, and the locomotive ran away and came about. But at that time, she had done 40 miles non stop. Still quite an achievement for um, such a small locomotive. But not to be beaten, they then decided on the 21st of July they were going to have another go. So this time uh, they were very lucky. Uh, Mr. Turpit uh, turned up and started to take a film event going on. The actual film is about 20 minutes long. I can assure you, you're not going to get the lot. But it's just the loco going round and round and round the track. But again, think about it, that was quite remarkable. The locomotive did not stop. You'll see in the film how they changed drivers. <coughs> but this trial started at 10.42 in the morning and it finished at 4.25 in the afternoon. see as I'll show you later on the documentation of the effect uh, from this um, these runs was uh, every piece of coal was weighed, the water was measured and very close details of how much uh, used. And you can see here that weighing the coal This is one of the most important items at the club, and still is today, although we don't have a Bunsen burner. Please make it. And please note the hygiene of making sandwiches. So if you ladies will be quiet. Now this was most, probably the most difficult bit of the lot, trying to oil the uh, locomotive while going along. So uh, here's how they exchange drivers. And there's the gentleman that kept the records, back to what was being done, that's what in there.
please note how smartly dressed they all wear ties and uh, kept themselves in uh, good shape. That was job done, that they had beaten the other record, which was 60 miles, and they built it with a smaller locomotive. Um, what I can say that they decided that that wasn't good enough. So on the 14th of July, 1954, they decided to have another go at it. And this time they did 101 miles uh, altogether, which is 500 and something like that. But um, I will quickly go through the next few slides um, to... This is Highland Lassie today. She doesn't have a green tender. She is fully serviceable and is a really beautiful engine. And uh, she did. She is still the world holder for three and a half inch, doing 101 miles stopping. That's in it. Now we were very very lucky that uh, these details were kept. So I'm going to go through them a bit quick because I just realised the, how the time's going. Uh, this was a 40 mile an hour, 40 uh, mile laps. She did 221 laps. She used 14 pounds of coal, 10 and a half gallons of water. In the August 54, she did 338, 70 miles, but she used 25 pounds of coal, to 23 gallons of water, and it was running for 10 hours, 10 minutes. Okay. And then we have a, a written account of uh, someone that was there. The, the time it started on the uh, 101 miles was, um, I know that's the same, uh, what we just said. Uh, if you, you can't really see, but on the next page of the, the report, she actually ran her, lost a fire. They dropped the fire and rebuilt it on the move uh, between lap 259 and 226. She was struggling a bit, but once the new fire was built, it uh, kept going. Um, this is a 101 miles. On the right hand side, you can see what the drivers did. Uh, the first time they drove for one hour, 17 minutes, 60 laps. By the time they get to the end of the day, they're struggling with about 10 or 20 laps each. It was really uh, back breaking work. And on the left hand side, you've got the, the document that was kept, how many laps she did, what coal she had, what water she had. And we have the full full uh, complement of these uh, documents okay and on the locomotive there is a um, a plaque that's put on her to say that she is a world record holder okay in 1960 you can see on the left hand side is the old track and it was built at the time when metal and wood was at a great shortage on the right hand side is the new track and highly uh, sophisticated and arches but between each arch, there's a metal strip and the track goes on top of that. The track we run today is that track. Um, there's a lot of technical problems, uh, technical renovations with the, the pillars. But as I say, I'm a little bit concerned of time. And so I won't go into too much detail with them. The track roughly is around the same um, position as the old one. Okay. Right, in 1969, uh, the club was invited to go to the BBC uh, to help in a Blue Peter programme on the 18th of June. And it was going to be broadcast the next day. So the BBC supplied the vehicles, they came down, picked it all up, and I'm going to show you a quick act, a bit from Blue Peter. <laughs>
Chingford and District Model Engineering Club. You can probably hear it, and now you can see it. And it's this magnificent, fully working, five-inch gauge steam locomotive. It's the Chingford Rambler. It's based on a great Central Atlantic class locomotive. It's been rebuilt quite a lot. The wheels are in 442 formation, and its name, the engine's name, is Firefly. On the side of the driver's cab, you can see the number, 684, and here on the tender itself, C and DMEC, which is Chingford and District Model Engineering Club. Now, I can also show you inside the cab, the coal goes inside here. I'm going to leave it just to open it up. I'll put a shovel on, one shovel of coal in there, a nice small shovel that should fit. I've succeeded in dropping most of the coal into the cab itself. I'll close that up again, that's fine. And then on here, this side of the cab, this is the reversing lever. It's got a forward gear there and a reverse gear there. It's now in neutral. And coming back over the top, this is the steam regulator. And in front of that, it's very hot, but I will blow it the whistle. Whoops, really hot there. And then from here down on this side is the hand brake. So I'm already, there's plenty of steam in there. The gauge is showing fine. So I'm going to go down the line to collect valve. And first things first, into first gear, hand brake right off, blow the whistle. And here I go. And this train really is remarkable because it's over 20 years old and it's still operating absolutely perfectly. Oh, and the beautiful stop. Can Climb on. Uh, you want to go that way, do you? Yeah, oh, all right. Back. Well, we'll go back. So I've got to Lovely. put it back into reverse, check we're all clear behind, <laughs> blow the whistle, open up the steam regulator, and back we go. I think that's just about the stopping place. Well stopped, Station Master. Very nice. Late again, driver Purvis. Late again. <laughs> so I got held up at the halt. Oh. Sorry about that. Fabulous train. <laughs> well, we'll be back again on Monday, and Daniel will be here with us in the studio. Oh, yes, but not only Daniel, because we'll also have the baby donkey that we gave him as, as his birthday present, and we'll be announcing the name that you've given her. And don't forget, you've only got one more day to send in your suggestion. See you on Monday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Come on. One of the surprising things we had from this um, getting the copy of the program was we were aware uh, that the Blue Peters, uh, we were at the Blue Peters studios, but we were actually told it was because of the Royal Train. Now, in front of us, you've got uh, two members of the club, uh, Peter Purvis, and three members, not the next one, three members of the Royal family, junior members, and they are Prince Edward, Lady Sarah, uh, Armstrong Jones and James Honorary. They were all five years old. And we were under the impression that they were in the program. Uh, we've only recently just got the, uh, the, the, the copy of the program and they're not. I've now written back to the BBC to see if they've got any further pictures uh, of uh, what went on that day. But uh, there's a roll train for you with five uh, junior members of the royal family. Right, we have um, another incident that we had. Like most men, they always got their bigger or their better or more powerful. Uh, so the club decided in 1982 to hold a competition to find out the most powerful in, in, uh, locomotive. I want to play that in the talk coming out. Now, this is a, a, a film we've only just recently got hold of. And I'm going to talk over it a little bit. But um, three locomotives were put into the competition. A, a Jim Nuttall from the Crawley Club had a, a five inch um, Garrett. And a Garrett is a locomotive that has a tender each end and the, uh, the, the drive wheels and the main bodies up off of it. Very powerful locomotives in the prototype. And he managed to pull 68 children and two adults. The adults were the um, uh, guards and brakemen. That locomotive is an RAF, that is RAF Holton, uh, the locomotive I was telling you earlier on, and uh, she managed to pay, uh, pull uh, nearly 70 locomotives in all. Um, and finally, we had the 9F from um, uh, the Eltham uh, Locomotive Society, and she played, uh, pulled 79 children, 
on her own with no support. And uh, those that know Ridgeway Park, there's the pond at the back. Um, not to be, he wasn't happy with that. He then did another further run with 86 children on board again, and he did three laps nonstop. Now, um, I wouldn't like to try that again uh, because there is uh, lots of people complaining about the length of the train. But uh, that gives you an idea of some of the uh, activities we've got up to. In 1985, it was decided that we were going to upgrade and make a larger railway. This is what we call the ground level. It's a seven and a quarter, which is even bigger than what we had. And this is the start of us building it. Okay. Um, and the lads are going in and it was not stop finished building now. Uh, we just opened an extension very recently and uh, this is the guys working at it. And uh, it was originally planned to go up to the Rose Garden, but um, one of the uh, neighbors in uh, Goldsburg Crescent complained they didn't want a steam train run up and down their back garden. So we were then offered the pond loop. Uh, by at that time, the uh, council had closed the, um, the pond for safety reasons. So we went round it. That locomotive is called Emu. Um, it was a electric uh, multiple unit. Uh, we used to use it uh, a great deal, but it doesn't carry many people and it takes a lot of space, storage space. So unfortunately we've sold it on and uh, we've now got more carriages and what have you. Okay. Now here's the start of the building of a new steam locomotive because we build our own locomotives. And this is the start of building of a locomotive called Gresley. And, it's, and this is more of them working in the workshops and uh, a picture from both ends of the boiler and a couple of the members working on it. And this is the locomotive uh, being completed and having a test drive uh, by with Rom and she's running. We also had made, this is Smetlin and it is a, a, a um, ground level. Uh, we made every bit of that, including the boiler. We have uh, we made we got a boiler smith, and we made that boiler. One of the things you may have noticed: the names, Firefly, Blackfly, Smetlin. If your German's not too good, Smetlin means butterfly. Every locomotive we build is something fly. We the, we've had a green fly, uh, but anyway, go on. The next one we have um, Smetlin. Okay. And some junior members. We have a, a, a junior members that start at the age of 10 um, or apprentices and they work till 12 and then from 12 to 16, uh, they're junior members. Uh, we allow them to do, um, apprentices have to have an adult present with them um, uh, up to the age of 12, but to junior members, we allow them to do everything we can do on the railway, except when we go into public service. Due to our insurances, we're not allowed to um, have anyone under the age of 16 looking after the public. Now, sometimes I think they've got more sun sense than some of the ones over 70, but mm. I'm really not allowed to say too much about that. Um, what are the other activities the club's done? We've been into uh, exhibitions from the word go, as you saw earlier on. The, the first one uh, was uh, within a year of the club opening, and we have been to a, a number of um, We've done Olympia, we've done Alexander Palace, we've been all over the place. Unfortunately, uh, we decided two years ago, just before the pandemic, that we were not going to do them anymore because there is a tremendous amount of work involved. Also, the only people that can really set them up are people that are retired, and some of these locomotives are very heavy. And it was decided for safety reasons uh, that we would stop doing Alexandra Palace specifically, um, uh, which is a great shame because we've done it for nearly 60 years. Okay. We also, part of the club, have uh, Wednesday night meets. We meet every Wednesday. During the summer, we meet at the railway. And as we did last night, uh, we get the junior members, get a train out or a locomotive out, and we do driver training where they're allowed to drive. Any adult that is not... Uh, competent we, we teach them how to drive and it gives them experience in the winter months we go to St Edmunds Hall and uh, we then put on uh, activities now what we have had is uh, talks on about what you, we have once a month called bits and pieces and this is where members come along and show off what they built what they're building 
or uh, if they got a problem, can someone help me out? Do I get out of this? Um, we have had uh, members from the Royal Air Force back the print flight come down and give us briefing on the servicing and maintenance of Spitfires. We've had um, people come and talk to us about the Lee Valley uh, flying and all sorts of things. And we cover all sorts of subjects and they're very, they can be very interesting. And I have to say the worst one I've ever been was a gentleman came along and uh, it was called 151 hand slits. Hand slits is a type of steam locomotive and there was 151 built. He had actually managed to get a picture of every 151 of them and we sat there looking at these pictures and this is number two and this is that, and it was not a very good night. But we normally have a very good time. We also run children's parties. Um, and uh, we, we have them on a, we normally uh, hire out the race track and uh, we don't use a station now, we use a military halt and uh, people can have the track for two hours, we guarantee three, uh, two locomotives, which can carry uh, only up to 30 children. Next one. Because we're in the park and we're an integrated part of the park now, whenever the park authorities and the council want to do anything within the park, we get involved. So to give an example, in 2009, they went for the green flag and part and parcel of the, uh, the tour was reopened the railway for them. And uh, I must be honest, ever since then, I think we're the main attraction um, of the green fly, uh, flag team because uh, they go around the park in five minutes and then they spend an hour riding around on the trains, enjoying themselves but, and, and drinking our tea. Um, during the summer, we sometimes run both railways and and we do uh, an exchange we charge extra um, people go around the track and the train will stop at the ridgeway unload get onto the other track and go around and we throw them out or we discharge them at willow tree and they have to walk across the field um, we do a track every year we do a charity event um, and we do all sorts of tra charities um, we've um, been improved um, we normally do it the first week in October after technically we've closed and we, we can raise between 800 and 1,300 pounds, which all goes to the charity. We've done Haven House. We've done the Rainbow Ward and one of the HHS hospitals, but we always try to go for a local children's hospital. That is what we look after as children. Uh, they ride on the railway, that's what they're there for. So we try to, su to support them. One of the other things we do, normally in June and July, in the last two years, we haven't been able to do it. We invite students from St. Joseph Clark School and Brookfield House School to come down to the railway and we open the railway specifically for them. Uh, they're helpers, they are both special needs school. And we've been doing that for over 30 years, way before I joined. And it's something that the members really do enjoy. And they then normally have a picnic after they've been riding on the railway and uh, things go forward from there, okay. One of the things is people think when September, October comes that the railway closes. Unfortunately, it doesn't. This is the time we start working hard. We've played all summer, we've played with our trains, now we've got to do the maintenance. And we have to, we start, if I start getting through, um, start building them, we built a path, uh, which the other one was the end of it. This is uh, building the path at the bottom end. We then replaced the platform is in a bad state and uh, we then had to hire heavy equipment because you can see the thickness of that concrete and uh, this is them digging it up and, and moving forward with that and we spent all winter uh, with the crew every Sunday doing work and as you can see the weather wasn't that particularly good but we carried on I got the job done we have a deadline um, we were allowed to have uh, lorries coming in with the heavy equipment and stuff we needed, but they had to be in and out the park at about half past eight uh, in the morning when the park was reasonably empty. Uh, all members, junior uh, apprentices and the older member in the background got involved painting and, and helping all the way along with what was going on. And uh, our brickland experts, um, started making arches to make it look nice. And this is the type of thing that uh, we came out with. And this was the platform when it was finished. And uh, these are the entrances. We changed the design of the entrance to make it a lot easier to operate. 
we then had the, because we got a grant out of the council, uh, the local local board forum, we invited the mayor, or it was Jeff Walker on the left hand side, and the three councillors uh, to come along and open it and have a ride round on the railway. And uh, this is the, them enjoying it. So, and uh, it's Matt Davis. No, he did not drive the train. We wouldn't trust a politician to drive a train. <laughs> but um, there are the three. We also have to do uh, servicing if the track gets damaged, uh, it moves because Chinkford is on London clay. It is moving all the time and the, the track gets uh, gets quite wobbly and up and down on occasion. So we have to uh, repair it the best we can. During the winter, normally, because the track is up, we can't open, but we have a winter steam up. It's our Christmas party. It's normally a week before Christmas. We all come up there. We play with our trains. We drink. Uh, we chat the wives up to come up and bring up food. And we have uh, plenty of tea. And uh, we have food and, and enjoy. And also, the one thing we like about it is because the weather's cold, the locos really look good with the steam coming out of them. This year... Um, it's the first year, no, 20, the last year, it was the first year we did not do any major maintenance on the track due to the fact that uh, COVID wasn't allowed to. So we actually opened and did a Christmas special. We got a Father Christmas down. No, I haven't got a slide of him, no. but uh, that's what we did. Now, I'm just going to end up with what we do today, give you a walk around the railway. And a certain person who's sitting about two foot to my left-hand side came down with his camera and uh, it gives you an idea what the club is doing now. Good afternoon and welcome to the Chinkford District Model Engineering Club uh, Miniature Railway in Ridgeway Park. Uh, we are in the process at the moment of setting it up, uh, ready to run this afternoon, uh, which involves getting the trains signalling and getting everything ready. And as we're in COVID at the moment, we also have to have our cleaning materials out so we can clean the carriages down after each run. Here we are in the Larkswood uh, signal box. Now, this signal box has taken somewhere over 10 to 15 years of uh, build, building, and it's uh, an absolute replica of the uh, real prototype signal box. All the levers, all the signals are interlocking so that you cannot pull off um, a signal which will make the trains crash into each other or things like that. It's an absolute phenomenal piece of work and uh, what does worry me and I'll be honest with you is only about two or three people actually understand how it all works but uh, it really is a, a, a one of our secret um, uh, pieces of equipment we have. That's Smetlin's new colour scheme. This is uh, Smetlin, it's one of the club locomotives, seven and a quarter. It was built by the club members at around 2000 time. Uh, it took 10 years to build because club locomotives normally take that length of time. She's been out of service and we're hoping to get her back into service next week. Um, the regulations of boilers changed and we had to take the boiler off and she has to be physically examined. But uh, David's been working on her. Uh, he's our senior engineer. And with luck, she'll be back into steam by next week. This is the club workshop. And, and this is Tim, who's the workshop supervisor and responsible for the safety and operation of this area of the club. This club workshop is for all club members to use if they feel confident to do it. We have bigger machines in here than people normally have in their own home workshops and different machines. The 
locomotives that we run on the club tracks can be bought, but a lot of people enjoy building them and building other things as well. Um, clocks, models of stationary engines, boats, all sorts of things, aeroplanes. Um, so this is here so that they can make bits for them because a miniature steam locomotive to go and buy a commercially made one is a very expensive business. Not only that, bits wear out. There seems to be an awful lot of companies come in to making model steam locomotives and then they disappear. And if people have bought them, they can't buy spares from anywhere. You have to make the spares. Uh, fortunately, uh, we still have a good number of members who enjoy making things. And they make things for themselves and for the club. Because of the uh, junior members who are coming along being computer literate and the foundry industry that makes castings for us shrinking and I think it will eventually die, you can't get things that you used to be able to buy. But with the aid of a CNC machine, or CNC two-axis milling machine, you can make things that are too comp well, not too complicated, but would take you a long time to make on a hand-controlled machine. We're here we are with Captain Howie, which is another club locomotive built by the members. Uh, unfortunately, we've had some um, visitors uh, living in it and we uh, had to uh, evict the, the mice in their home, but it has caused us some uh, internal problems. And Ron and Chris here are trying to sort it all out and uh, get it working again. This is the uh, second railway we have here, which is the five inch, three and a half inch, five inch track. Um, the original uh, railway that was set up in 1946 uh, ran roughly where the, the, the main track is today. What we're looking at at the moment is the steaming bays and engine shed of the smaller locomotives. And we have uh, one locomotive here which is called uh, Mayflower. Uh, and this one is called Friendship. This is a club locomotive. Um, this one is a, a privately owned locomotive which is still being worked on. That's why the cabin's missing. And we have numerous other locomotives here. Uh, we have one in, being rebuilt at the moment called Firefly, which we purchased in 1948. Um, and that is almost like Trigger's Broom. It's had three heads and four handles. There's not much, uh, we believe that the actual nameplates are original, but we're not sure about anything else. This is our third track. This is a gauge one. Uh, this project started uh, about seven, eight years ago when uh, we were contacted by a gentleman's uh, wife as he had died and we was asked if we were interested in uh, having his workshop uh, donated to us. I went down to the house and we agreed to take um, his lathe and what have you but when I looked in the garden there was a gauge one railway running around so I asked what was going to happen to this railway and she basically said it's going into a skip. So we decided that uh, we had a quick meeting and the numbers of people who were interested in Gage 1, we all went down there and scavenged as much as equipment and things that we could have. Uh, since then, um, there wasn't quite enough to build what we've got now. We've slowly improved on it and we now have a very vibrant uh, Gage 1 part of the club that comes up here a couple of times a week and actually runs steam trains on here as well. Unfortunately, passengers can't ride on it. Uh, 
This is Ridgeway Station. It's uh, about the third or fourth uh, building of its type we've had here over the uh, 70 odd years. Um, in here it is, is our mess hall, uh, our rubbish dump where coats and everything else stay. Um, but also we have on display a number of locomotives that have historical value with the club. This is our display case. Um, we have three green locomotives which were all designed and built for an international modeling engineering exhibition. They are absolutely superbly built and uh, this one came first at the exhibition and I believe that one came second uh, in a different year. Um, they are really good but they are not suitable for what we call public uh, running. They are too delicate and too nice. Uh, the bottom one actually has a, a boiler fault and we had to make the decision where we repair it or put it on show. The reason we put it on show because if we tried to repair it we would damage the paintwork and we would damage some of the locomotive. So we thought it's much better to keep it in its pristine position. This locomotive here is Highland Lassie. Uh, she is the world uh, record holder of 101 miles uh, non-stop. Um, she was sold from the club when the owner died but we managed to retain it back and uh, we, we've now got it on display and she can still run. She's an absolutely beautiful locomotive. As I've already said to you uh, during the, uh, my presentation about Walt Disney, uh, this is the display we've put up to in, show people that it wasn't a figment of their imagination and he really did come here. Uh, one of the interesting things is, which I have already think I said, is that picture there is a locomotive called Bambi and there is actually Walt Disney looking at it and examining it. We've had the great fortune that uh, the lady that owned it uh, donated it to us about two years ago, 18 months ago, and we do plan to have it hanging from the ceiling one day, but it's not a major project. Our major concerns at the moment is to keep the railways running. Well, that is a quick tour of the uh, railway in Midway Park. Um, everybody here is volunteers and uh, they all work hard. We have about 80 members and uh, everybody has different interests. As you've met Tim, who is uh, into the workshop in a big way. Uh, David is our engineer. Ron and Chris uh, are repairing locomotives. So we're always looking for members. Um, we've always welcomed down. But I must say we have one rule that uh, if you become a member, we ask you to give up normally five Sundays a year to help run the railway. You don't necessarily have to have any specific skills. Um, anything from tea making to gardening to anything you can imagine. We will teach you uh, what to do if you want to drive. You will be shown how to drive. You will be shown how the signalling works and everything like that. So if you're interested, come down and see us. Also, uh, we are very, very lucky that our forefathers kept records of um, lots of the activities in the club and we are looking for more. If anyone has got any other interesting tippets, we would love to know. We actually have a black hole from 1959 to 1964 where we don't have any information at all about the club. Uh, we don't know who the ch committee was, we don't know who the uh, where the money went, where the money was spent. So uh, if you know anything about that, please uh, come and see us. We would lo love to know and fill this black hole in. But one last thing I would like to say is we charge the members of the public to ride on the railway. We are very popular, but the money we raise, every penny goes back into the railway. We get no outside support. Um, the council are generous to us with our rent, but other than that, the, the railway is completely self-sufficient. Thank you very much for visiting us. Well, I think I've run over my allotted time and um, 
what I want to do is uh, thank everyone for the support, especially your chairman, who has uh, guided through, through the uh, computer problems. Um, Acorn Films, the BBC, Chingford at War, where some of the items we've got from uh, to, to put in this uh, presentation. But anyway, thank you all very much. I hope I haven't bored you too much, and uh, I'll we'll see you again sometime. Fantastic, Roy. Thank you very much indeed for that talk. In fact, I'm just going to squeeze in here so you can see me as well. Let's have a round of applause for Roy, please. Come on. Fantastic. Very, very good. Very, very good. Now, we're going to open up um, uh, the line so that if anyone out there would like to ask Roy a question, if you could just raise your hand so Joanna can see you, we can open up your microphone and um, fire away with any questions you've got. Gary, can you ask him to stop sharing? Because okay, I can't that's me actually. I'll doing. stop sharing. One moment. I'll just come off there. Nope. Stop sharing. Yes, there we are. Is that better? Yeah. Great. So I've got Roy with me now. If anyone would like to ask a question uh, uh, about Roy or the uh, Model Engineering Club, please ask away. There is one question in the chat. Go ahead. Um, what metal is the current rack? track made of uh, it is steel um, we did use aluminium at one stage on the ground level oh sorry on the race track but it's that's not very good when it's wet and the, the locomotive it, it's, it's proper steel steel rails thank you any other questions out there well while we're waiting for a question to come in i've got one for you Roy. i'd like to know about the state of the model engineering clubs in britain i mean you mentioned that um you know, um, some of these um, uh, engines that are built and perhaps um, are left in attics or under stairs. I mean, what is the current situation in the UK? There is about 80 to 90 of the model engineering clubs like ours. Uh, it is, but they're getting bigger and um, the smaller ones are dying away because of the, uh, um, the cost. They're, they're not, it's not a cheap hobby to do on your own. That's why you need a club like ours because <coughs> give you an example, smetling costs about £15,000 on her own. Uh, you saw a locomotive in there called Mayflower, that was £5,000. They're not a cheap, it's not a cheap hobby. Right. Um, that's why we go for club locomotives. It allows people who um, want to come in, youngsters and what have you. But no, the, 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 there's a number of societies have died over the pandemic. Uh, because of the pandemic, but uh, we were very lucky to survive as well. Thanks for that. Have we got a message? Um, um, Rogers just asked, um, he seems to remember in the 60s or 70s, the railway had a royal visitor. Mm. Is that true? I don't know. That one's caught me napping. <laughs> Can he tell us who it was? Yeah. <laughs> Does he know? No. Roger, do you know who it was, the royal visitor? <laughs> maybe not no i must admit i don't know i'll look at it i've gone through all the records more than once um but i'll have another go i don't know anything i'm not sure that don't know that one sorry okay do we have any other questions out there oh, um, john, john, john gilbert um gauge one was mentioned more than once what 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 exactly is gauge one please about, um uh you got, you know what, our, you then got O, and it's the next one up. It's gauge one. It, it's about an inch and a half track. The, the gap between yeah. the track is inch and a half. Um, so we have uh, gauge one, which is inch and a half, uh, three and a half inch, five inch, seven and a quarter. They're the mm -hmm. four gauges of railways we run. Right. Thank you. Any interesting. Uh, sorry, who's that? Is that Jim? Uh, un unmute yourself, Jim. Unmute. That's it. Go right. ahead. Roy, um, clearly the society has developed quite considerably uh, from the point of view of the track. Um, do you have any long term or mid term projects on the books that you would like to see come off in due course? We've always had, yes, we've always had a dream that we would like to send the track up to uh, the um, Rose Garden near Endleberry Road. Uh, but um, 
we it's the cost will be phenomenal but one of the things that's on the cards which we hope to get going soon is to put a canopy over larkswood station so when people are queuing up to get on the train and if it does spit with rain they don't get wet and if the train's sitting there you're not going to sit on a wet seat that's one of the other projects we've got um the signal box we're expanding all the time uh, if you go into the park at the moment we've purchased a prototype a real size lever frame that we're going to get uh, to, to work the, the good yard um, uh, and that's all being done at the moment so that's one of the other jobs that's on there but uh, at the moment because of the pandemic our priority for the last 18 months is to keep the club going um, when the pandemic hit the, our finances was down to 600 pounds which is quite normal because our earning capacity is uh, april through to you know, uh, october and then during the winter we spend the money on projects so when we get to april normally we're not worried or got no money we're going to start money we'll earn some money uh, 2020 it didn't happen we didn't go back and at one stage, we were very, very concerned we would not have sufficient money to pay the, um, you've lost me. Yes, um, they're still there, they're still there. Um, we didn't have sufficient money to pay for the public liability insurance, which we have to pay before the railway opens. And uh, that's um, a priority. We managed to raise it. We're still here and we're still plodding along. So thank you, Jim. Thank you. Any other questions out there? please the, there are loads of people saying that they really enjoyed the talk i don't know if um, roy can see the chat. Oh, let's get the chat up let's just have a quick look here roy here's the chat here so these are what people have said brilliant presentation right yeah fantastic thank you very much indeed he's appreciated yeah. many thanks roy great brilliant i mean to, for, from my point of view i mean I, look i had children i put them on the railway as everyone else did in this room i'm sure um, but it's great to go backstage and look at, you know, all the intricate workings and um, to see that workshop where they actually make tools and make parts for these engines was absolutely fascinating. It took me back to my days at school when I did, um, you know, metal engineering. And uh, it's just um, a wonder that uh, you can continue um, building and maintaining these engines um, after all this time, because I'm sure a lot of the skills have gone well that's one of the things we're doing that's the reason why we spent 20 odd thousand pounds uh buying a, a cnc mini machine was because that's what the youngsters understand so our priority is to teach the youngsters what to do how to do it because it's the skills aren't going mm. they're not there uh tim's a, a, a right so and so on occasions you're not allowed to use any of the machines until you can prove to him you can cut a piece of metal straight with a hacksaw. Uh, he goes back to the old skills. You've got to have the old skills before you let you play on the big stuff. And um, we've got one or two coming along, uh, but most of the kids want to drive trains or be a train driver. Absolutely. OK, one last shout out to anyone that's got a question they'd like to ask. Now is your chance to ask Roy about uh, the Chinkford um, Miniature Railway. Anyone there? OK, I think we've uh, we've exhausted all the questions. So, uh, Roy, on behalf of the Society, thank you very much for uh, coming in today. I've been fascinated by it. It's been a great journey for me. And I'm sure um, that we'll, um, you know, if we can find the time in the next year or two to get you back on again, I'm sure you'll have a bit more history to tell us when you, because Roy actually is in the process ongoing if you like of researching more about the club aren't you so i'm sure some more information will come out about that over uh, the coming years and you may well find a few more engines out there uh, as well